what we're going to do here is we're going to look at something that's known as enumeration. And enumeration is just a fancy word for counting, and the counting that we'll be doing is a sort of fancy counting. Uh, you'll have to forgive me, the very first example is very trivial, uh, but it illustrates one of the principles that we need to go. So we're at a conference, and as an attendee, I'm going to order a boxed lunch. So I get the menu, there are five choices of boxed lunch that contain some sort of meat, and two vegetarian options. How many selections are there total? Yes, it's very simple. The answer is seven, because you have to choose one of the five meat or one of the two vegetarian options. Um, there are only seven options available. But this illustrates something that's actually quite uh, sophisticated in this enumeration um, activity. We have what's called the sum principle. I prefer to call it counting by cases, because that's what it really boils down to. Okay, and very straightforward. Uh, if we have M options for some, uh, some selection that we're going to make of type A, and N options for our selection of type B, we're going to say that the types are mutually exclusive, which I'll define later. Um, a single selection is made from either type A or type B, then there are M plus N total options. By mutually exclusive, we mean that there is no overlap between the two different types. Okay, so in our example, we had vegetarian options or meat options. There's no overlap there. Okay? So the sum principle just says that there are m plus n total options. Again, very simple case example that we have here, but as we go on, we'll see how it can be a little bit more sophisticated. Okay? This sum principle also extends if there is another a third type, type C, or a third and a fourth, types C and D. So it's not just restricted to two, but it works out nicely to talk about two. Another principle we're going to talk about is called the multiplication principle, and this example will help illustrate that. College student hasn't done laundry in a while. Um, he's down to his last three pairs of pants and his last five shirts. How many possible outfits can he make? Okay, now we're going to assume that he's going to wear the pants on his legs and the shirts over his head. He's not going to put the pants on over his head. Uh, so, um, how might we go about answering this question if we don't know some of these counting principles? Well, what we could do is we could list out all the possibilities, and a nice way to list them out would be by looking at some sort of table. So over here we see he has options of blue, gray, or onyx pants. Onyx is the same as black, but black and blue both start with B's, so we chose onyx instead. Um, and then shirts, we have yellow, red, green, purple, and white. <clears throat> Okay. And this chart tells you exactly how many there are. There are 15 because there are three rows and five columns. And you can see over here the GP represents that he's wearing gray pants and a purple shirt. Okay. We're not going to say that he's going to worry about whether or not things clash. Okay, But we can see that there's multiplication taking place here. 3 times 5 is 15. And this is what's known as the multiplication principle. So we suppose we have a two-step process, and there are m ways to complete the first step in our two-step process, and to n ways to complete the second step. Well, then there are m times n ways to complete the entire process. As with the sum principle, this can extend to more than um, just two options. Maybe we have a two-step process. Maybe we have a ten-step process. Same sort of idea. <clears throat> so our next example will illustrate this. We have a student organization that has 20 members, and they're going to select a group of officers, a president, a vice president, and a secretary. How many different outcomes are possible? Well, think about what, are, what's, uh, what would make an officer combination. Um, well, we'd need to know which three people are going to be the officers, but that's not enough, because I could have the same three people holding these offices, yet still have a different outcome. For example, we could have Larry, Curly, and Mo as president, vice president, and secretary, respectively. So Larry is the president, and so on. Well, that would be very different than if Mo were president, Curly were vice president, and Larry were secretary. Okay, so we would treat those as two different outcomes. All right, so let's think about the process we would do this. Well, we could, well, let's see, we could pick all three people and then assign them, but I think it's easier if we pick one office at a time. So then what we'll do is we'll pick the president. Once we know who the president is, then we're going to pick the vice president. Once we know the first two offices, we'll pick the secretary. Now it's pretty straightforward to see what our options are. Okay, 
We picked the president. There are 20 choices for that. We're going to make an assumption here that the president and vice president have to be two different people. So I can no longer choose the president when I'm selecting the vice president. So there are 19 choices there. And then there are 18 choices for secretary. And if you multiply all that out, we get 6,840. Well, now we're going to look at a special case. What if Oscar and Felix are always butting heads and they refuse to work together? So we can't have an officer where Oscar's president, Felix is secretary, and Mary is vice president because officer, or Oscar and Felix are on the same group. How many elections are possible if these two are not together? Well, something that's very helpful in these problems is just, just to think about the different types of outcomes that we could have. For example, Oscar could be one of the three officers, maybe let's say vice president, but then Felix could not be president or secretary. On the other hand, Felix could be one of the officers, maybe president, but then Oscar can't be vice president or secretary. And so if we think about it, are there any other possible cases? Well, yeah, there is another possible case if neither of them holds an office. So it seems like we have three different cases, and this is why I call the sum rule counting by cases, because we look at them individually. All right, so let's just focus on how we would fill an office or the offices when Oscar holds one of them. We could pick an office for Oscar. Once we know what office Oscar holds, then we're going to pick the remaining two slots. We will fill them, let's say, um, from the highest position available down to the lowest. So, for example, if Oscar is vice president, then the next person we pick will be the president, the next person will be secretary. Well, the same thing would be true when we go um, do the selection for Felix. And then when we do the selection with neither of them, it's going to be very similar to what we had up here, except if we don't want Oscar or Felix, then there are only 18 options for the president because Oscar and Felix are out of contention. And so um, just a little uh, notation here to explain where things are coming from. These are the three cases. Oscar holds some office, and then, that's what the colons, I guess, are, I'm going to choose to mean, and then X and Y fill the remaining two positions. Here, Felix holds some office, and then X and Y choose the remaining, or fill the remaining two positions, and here Oscar, or we have three people who to fill all three offices, neither of whom, none of whom are Oscar or Felix. Okay, um, so we first pick Os Oscar's office. There are three choices for Oscar's office, president, vice president, or secretary. Now, there's two offices that are not filled, neither of which can be filled by Felix. So there are 18 choices who fill for who fills the highest office, and 17 choices who fills for who fills the next office, the remaining office. Well, the same thing is going to happen with Felix, right? There are three options for which office Felix holds, and then 18 people can fill the highest remaining position, and then there are 17 choices for who fills the only remaining office. And then finally, there are 18 choices. If we don't have either Oscar or Felix, there are 18 people who could be president, 17 who could be vice president, and 16 who could be secretary. Now you notice something kind of different up here. 20, if I label that with a unit, that's 20 people. There are 20 people that can fill, fill the president slot. There are 19 people who can fill the vice president slot and 18 people who can fill the secretary slot. Down here, the three is not a representation of people, but a representation of the office. Okay, there are three people who could fill the president position. And then there, or there is, I'm sorry, excuse me, there are three offices that Oscar could um, hold, and then there are 18 people that some other, or that could hold the highest remaining office, and there are 17 people who could hold the next highest remaining office. So the three is from the three, we're selecting from three offices, then 18 people, then 17 people. Three offices, 18 people, 17 people. Here we have 18 people, 17 people, 16 people. You sometimes have to look at it from a different perspective. We might be selecting people sometimes. We might be selecting offices other times. Well, before I go on to the next example, I want to find the answer to part B in a slightly different way. Let's suppose we have an outcome that violates the conditions of part B. 
we say Oscar and Felix cannot work together. Well, what if they did work together? To count the number of ways that Oscar and Felix cannot work together, what we can do is we can count all selections and take away all elections in which both Oscar and Felix are chosen. Okay, well, how would we, let's just focus on the second part of this. We already know how to count all of them. It was 20 times 19 times 18. How are we going to count the number of um, elections in which both Oscar and Felix hold an office? Well, what we could do is we could first pick which office Oscar is going to hold. Then we'll pick the office that Felix will hold. There will be one position uh, remaining. We'll fill um, that with one of the remaining 18 people. So there are three offices that Oscar can hold, two that Felix can hold, and once we've filled those, there are 18 ways to choose who gets the remaining position. Okay. All right, so the number of total elections is 20 times 19 times 18. There are three times two times 18 ways to fill the offices so that Oscar and Felix are together, and we get the same number. In these counting problems, if you ever, ever end up with the same number, you are pretty confident that you've got the right answer. Okay, if you ever end up with the same number, doing two different methods. Okay, we have a okay. A couple more examples here just to illustrate what kinds of expressions can appear in these problems. So here you have 23 children that go to visit a chocolate factory on a field trip. At the end of the trip, each of them is offered a selection of one of four types of candy. <coughs> okay, how many ways can the class choose their candy? What do we mean by that? Well, um, we want to imagine the children walking up to the counter and selecting their candy. The first child gets up there and they can choose from white chocolate, uh, dark chocolate, milk chocolate, or chocolate with almonds. There are four choices. So the first child, there are four options. The second step in our process will to be let will to um, be to have the second child choose his or her chocolate. Well, again, the first child didn't, his or her selection does not forbid the second child from picking any chocolate. Okay, so there's still four options for the second child. There will be four options for the third child and four options for each of the children. So we would multiply all of these fours together. There are 23 of them total. And so we're going to end up with four to the 23rd. That's a heck of a lot of different options for how the chocolates can be chosen. Um, so you'll see these exponential expressions from time to time. Another expression that we'll see, um, we have to define as we go. Now we've got these 23 children. It's time to get back on the bus. How many ways can we line them up to get back on the bus? Okay. Well, for the first child, we're going to pick who gets to be in line first. And this happens a lot in the schools. You know, all right, uh, Audrey, you get to go first. Um, you're the line leader. So the 23 choices for who is the line leader. Well, behind that person, uh, there will be 20, there are only 22 available uh, children from which to choose. So the 22 children, choices for that. The third child can't be either of the first two children. So there are 21 choices. So this is similar to the election that we had, um, except that we're going to continue to multiply these numbers all the way down to one. At the end, when 22 children have lined up, there's only one choice for who's going to be the last child. Okay, so it's 23 times 22 times 21, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1, and we're going to introduce some notation here. We're going to write this product of all the integers from 1 to 23 as 23 with an exclamation point afterwards. We call this 23 factorial. We're going to say in general the number n factorial, um, which is an n with an exclamation point afterwards, this is the product of all positive integers from 1 to n. Okay. So this is what it looks like very generically. n times the next smallest number, which is n minus 1, times the next smallest number, which is n minus 2, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. Just by convention, we'll define 0 factorial to be 1. Okay. So exponential expressions, factorials, are things that will commonly occur in these uh, counting types of problems.